I'm your host, Adriana Pavsic, Community Engagement Coordinator with Florida College Access Network. Before we get started with today's presentation, a few housekeeping items. First, we welcome your questions. You can submit them at any time in the Q&A box. Second, please share what you are learning on social media. Feel free to tag FCAN and use the hashtags FCAN and TalentStrongFL. Finally, this webinar is being recorded. All materials will be available, including this presentation in a few days on our website. Before we get started, a little background on FCAN. Our mission is to lead the collaborative movement to ensure every Floridian achieves an education beyond high school and a rewarding career. Our vision is to see a Florida working together where education is the pathway to economic mobility for all. We do our work in three primary ways, local college access networks, which are cross-sector coalitions of leaders that collaborate to remove barriers and provide more support for student success. We also publish research and data on evidence-based practices and policy opportunities to strengthen Florida's talent pool. Lastly, we coordinate four College Ready Florida initiatives that provide schools and community organizations resources to help students continue their education after high school. FKIN's work is guided by our seven conditions for success. Today's webinar provides great examples of many of these conditions, including opportunity for everyone, affordability, multiple, multiple pathways to success, and community collaboration. Before we get started, we have a few questions to ask all of you. So I will fire off the first poll, which is, are you currently working with students who are in foster care? Yes, no, or are you not sure? So I'll give it a few more seconds. So we have 62% of you saying yes, and then 15% saying no, and about 24% saying not sure. So then our second poll that we will fire is, are you currently working with students who are facing housing insecurity? Yes, no, or are you not sure? Give it a few more seconds. So we have about 69% of you saying yes, 9% saying no, and 21% saying not sure. And our next question we have is, what is your biggest challenge when trying to help students from foster care pursue post-secondary education? Are you unaware of resources and benefits available? Not sure who to contact for advice? Helping students understand their potential or helping students get and or stay on track to graduate. Give it a few more seconds. Okay, so we this one is pretty all over the board with unaware of resources and benefits leading the way and helping students get and or stay on track with a close second. So our last question we have for you is how comfortable are you with advising students in foster care about the post-secondary resources available for them? Very comfortable, comfortable fairly or slightly or not at all. So I'll give it a few more seconds. Okay, so this one is pretty scattered all across the board, which is why we are here today to help you with this process along the way. So next, today's presenters include Brett McNaught, CEO of Educate Tomorrow, Dr. Steve J. Rios, Senior Director of Positive Pathways Program, Wendy Joseph, College Coach, Educate Tomorrow, and Dr. Amy Rubinson, Researcher and Care Coordination Manager at Educate Tomorrow. We will also hear from current student Brandy Gordon and previous student Janessa Collins to hear their perspectives on how to better serve our students. Getting us started today is Brett McNaught, CEO of Educate Tomorrow. Welcome Brett and thank you for joining us today. 
Uh, thank you for having us. We really appreciate the partnership with FCAN in spreading the word about opportunities that um, youth from foster care and homeless settings have when it comes to accessing post-secondary education. Um, Educate Tomorrow is a nonprofit based out of Miami, Florida. We started in 2003, really because our founders uh, identified that there were these college tuition exemptions for youth from foster care, and were determined to make sure that that an opportunity such as free tuition to college did not go, um, you know, uh, underutilized. And, and at the time, um, we know that. Only eight students uh, 20 years ago were on, are on record of using tuition exemptions back then. And we know that number is now uh, north of 6,000 uh, in recent years. So uh, a lot has been done in raising the awareness that youth uh, who have experienced foster care or um, unstable housing uh, qualify for tuition and fee exemptions. Um, but we just wanna make sure that as many people know about this as possible. And being able to speak with you all today, being uh, in, your, in your professions, um, working with students who uh, may be in the K through 12 system who may qualify for these exemptions and may or may not know that they even qualify. Uh, it's extremely important that um, you have uh, some resources at your disposal that you know um, the basics of what qualifies a student for opportunities and that if you have additional questions you know who to reach out to and that will be um, the positive pathways program that we uh, administer as a department of children and families contract uh, dr steve rios operates that he'll, he'll be able to share a little bit about what he does and how he can connect you uh, to on-campus resources throughout the state. Uh, we also have Wendy Joseph here, who is a college coach at Miami-Dade College. And since uh, she has been in her role uh, and at the end of 2013, uh, we've seen over 400 um, degrees earned by students using these waivers. Um, so we're very encouraged by that. Uh, we have two students with us today and Dr. Amy Rubinson that runs our programs. So uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Brandy uh, Gordon, who is a student um, and, uh, and a natural and a helper with Educate Tomorrow, uh, help students um, who are in college uh, progress towards graduation. So Brandy, you know, please take it away. You're an expert in this and I, I would love to hear your perspective. Thank you, Brett. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brandy Starks Gordon. Um, I'm a recent graduate from Miami Dade College in which I've obtained my bachelor's degree in exceptional student education. And while at Miami Dade College, I was introduced to the program Educate Tomorrow in which I'm still currently a Educate Tomorrow student. And while at Miami Dade College was a change maker peer mentor. I'm now a current student at Florida International University. Um, pursuing a graduate degree in math and social work. So as far as my transition goes from high school to college, I can say that my mom was involved enough to where I was aware that I had a DCF tuition waiver. However, while um, pursuing my degree at Miami Dade College, the DCF tuition waiver was a little foreign to um, MDC. But fortunately, thanks to Educate Tomorrow, I was introduced to a support of people who were able to guide me while um, in, in during my pursuing my academic endeavors at Miami Dade College. Um, as far as Educate Tomorrow goes, I was granted a college coach, Ms. Wendy, in which she helped me um, helped me with academic enrollment, um, introduced me through um, too many different um, scholarship opportunities, job opportunities, leadership opportunities, and which I mentioned earlier, becoming a change maker peer mentor which was a big help to me as far as my academic career went because um, prior to being introduced to Educate Tomorrow, I was not an involved student. Honestly, I went to school just to go, but during my um, own personal journey, I realized the importance of um, having a balance. So not only going to school, 
but making sure that I take advantage of the community that's available to me. So as a, a change maker peer mentor, I was able to um, be an example all while learning to um, with my college peers, as far as academic enrollment, providing tutoring services, and just ensuring that they were made known of the um, community that was there for them to ensure that academic success was granted to them. So um, again, as I mentioned before, I'm truly grateful for Educate Tomorrow because for me to be transparent, my grades were horrible. Um, my GPA was 0.5, I believe, but um, with the help and actually receiving the help with Educate Tomorrow and the resources available to me while I'm at Day College, I was able to graduate from cum laude and better assist my um, college peers while as I was going to school myself. And even me being a graduate student now, that wasn't in my goals at all, but um, actually re um, receiving my bachelor's, it encouraged me to pursue an even further or higher education for myself. So I say all this to say that um, it is very important and I advise all um, high school, anybody in high school that's assisting, watch the students to ensure that you not only just um, encourage students to pursue a post-secondary um, education, but ensure that you create a solid foundation or relationship with the students because you can say all of this is available to you, but some students are just focused on survival. So um, again, all of the opportunities that come with being a foster student after a um, high school graduation is great and is one that everyone should take advantage of if they're eligible. But in order for one to receive the help, I can attest to the importance of having a genuine foundation or relationship with the student. So um, that's my true um, honest opinion. Just make sure the relationship with your students are genuine, that you're patient because again, me, even though I was interested to educate tomorrow, I wasn't really um, receiving the help that was offered to me. It was me testing it out, a little trust issues, but with patience from my college mentors, um, being around like-minded students and knowing that I'm not the only one who was a foster student, I mean, foster care um, kid and all of those things, it helped um, make me put my walls down. So that's my um, honest advice for you all today. And I just encourage you all to, it's a process basically um, while helping the foster kids that you guys service at your schools. That's great. Thank you so much, Brandy. I really appreciate you sharing from your heart. Um, it means so much to have young people who are willing to talk about the things that, um, that they went through. And, um, you know, just to see 0. 0.5, from a 0. 0.5 GPA to a graduate student now, that little testimony just speaks volumes. So I am Dr. Steve Rios, and um, I run the Positive Pathways program with uh, Brett McNaught. We administer this program for the Department of Children and Families. It's one of the very few programs of its kind in the country. Um, and I'm gonna be speaking a little bit about that as well as sharing some of the benefits that young people from CARE have um, and homeless students as well. First, let me just thank Florida College Access Network. Um, Kathy McDonald and I have been talking about this for a while. And it's very encouraging that so many of you throughout the state have indicated that you want this kind of training. Uh, for more than 400 people to register, it's, it's really a tremendous testament to your, your, your interest in our work. So let me just start off by saying that the number of students from foster care who are attending college um, using the state tuition waiver to attend college and university and even technical colleges has increased tremendously. Uh, so you can see right there from 2015, 2016 to 2018, or even after 2019, uh, it went up from 4,200 to nearly 7,000. Uh, the numbers have dropped off a little bit, clearly because of uh, COVID in the last year or two. Um, but at the same time, um, the numbers have not been as dramatic as they could have been um, if you didn't have the kind of, if they didn't have the kind of support that they do around the state, which I'll talk about more. The number of uh, students using the homeless waiver at the uh, college, uh, the, at the state university system is um, about 400. 
which is a pretty small number considering the number of students uh, who are considered homeless at the high school level. And those numbers are shown here. Um, the numbers above 58,000 homeless students uh, throughout the country and 3,500 here in Florida. That's students who indicated on their FAFSA uh, that they were homeless. And that um, this is, these numbers are a little bit old. Um, so more um, accurate and more recent numbers are right there in the middle. It shows you that 91,000 public school students experienced homelessness over the course of a year. That's a lot of young people. And 6,700 uh, or so were unsheltered. Most of these students, as you can see, um, are what they call students who are doubling up. That means they're just living with somebody else that they know or friends or family members. The small percentage are actually in hotels or motels or in shelters, okay? That just gives you a sense of what's going on overall. And what I wanted to do is just um, talk to you about some of the opportunities that the young people from foster care have once they hit that 18 years old. Um, this is one program, it's called Extended Foster Care. And it's really important for us to know that here in Florida, as well as a, a good number of other states, students can remain under the jurisdiction of the state until age 21. This has made a tremendous difference in the lives of so many young people who can continue to get this support even after they turn 18. Uh, those days of 18 years old and out um, are really over if the young person here in Florida wants them to be over. In other words, we have a system that's set up that they could age in to these additional supports. Extended foster care is one of the, uh, the least supportive. And then there is this program, uh, which is called Post-Secondary Education Services and Support. This is a statewide program. Students in this program are required to um, attend a Florida Bright Futures institution uh, or meet other eligibility requirements. And they can get up to $1,256 in a stipend. Um, those students who are not going to a Florida Bright Futures institution, maybe a private school, can actually access the Florida's or the education and training voucher. These are funds that are available up to $5,000 to support their education or job training if they're not in a Florida Bright Future College. The young person uh, needed to have been 18 while in the legal custody of the Department of Children and Families or at least 18 when um, at least 18 and adopted after the age of 16 from foster care or placed with the court approved uh, dependency guardian. Now, what has recently happened is that students who are uh, less than 18 years old um, can access um, the tuition waiver, which we're gonna be talking about shortly. Um, this PEST program is up until students are 23 years old. It does not include age 23. The homeless exemption is um, another exemption that is available to students uh, who may, um, who are homeless. And as you can see, the Florida statutes 1009 cover this. Um, these students are exempt from tuition and fees, including lab fees at these kinds of institutions. The definition of what's homeless, that's the big challenge. Uh, it's actually, as we speak, being considered and potentially changed by the Florida legislature. So um, as it stands now, it's a student who lacks a figure, a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence. Obviously, some of those terms are open for interpretation. Um, and this is what's going on now. But um, there are, there's a wide variety of ways that they can obtain this exemption. And that's part of the problem. So the tuition waiver um, is good for students up to age 28. And this is really the foundation of the work that we do at Positive Pathways. Um, this exemption is for students who were in the custody or were adopted or were in the custody of a relative or non-relative or placed in guardianship by the court. 
after reaching 16 years of age. <clears throat> Throughout the state of Florida, the students who are using these waivers are at colleges and technical colleges and universities. And fortunately here in Florida, um, the state expects that there will be educational coaching positions or now being called foster care liaisons on every campus. And um, this is actually in Florida law, as you can see here. And so Positive Pathways is the Department of Children and Families program, which was developed in order to support these campus-based um, professionals. Throughout the state, you will see that some colleges and universities have stronger, more consistent and focused programs than others. Here's just an example of some programs that are um, strong and focused and consistent and have been around for a while. These are the public universities that have one of these type of programs and initiatives. And these are the colleges. A couple of these have just really strengthened over the past couple of years with support from Helios Education Foundation and Educate Tomorrow. For those colleges and universities that may not have a strong um, focused program, the department and Positive Pathways have set up regional points of contact. And this information is available on our website, which I'll share with you. This is our website, positivepathwaysflorida.org, that you can see that we have conferences, we have newsletters, we have professional development, et cetera. You can find a foster care liaison anywhere in the state by going to our website, positivepathwaysflorida.org, and using our searchable function to just type in the city or to type in the college, and that information will come up. I'd like to um, tell you about a certain, our upcoming um, monthly call, during which we're going to be talking about the results of a survey that we sent out throughout the state of Florida. If you're interested in this topic, please feel free to go to positivepathwaysflorida.org and register for this upcoming meeting. And I definitely invite you to join us uh, with Positive Pathways as well. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Wendy Joseph. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Dr. Rios. And I'd like to also thank our folks over with the Florida College Access Network for giving me the opportunity to share with you all today. So we've heard a couple of remarks about the DCF tuition exemption. And I just want to really underscore the idea that the DCF tuition exemption or the DCF tuition waiver as it's often referred to is the gateway to post-secondary opportunities for students impacted by the foster care system. This um, creates um, a space for students who, um, unlike their peers, they do not have to deal with the burden of figuring out how to finance their post-secondary goals. This gives students the opportunity to study for an unlimited number of credits. They can earn an unlimited number of degrees up until the age of 28, as was previously shared. One of the biggest ways that you can support your students is to understand the eligibility requirements for the DCF tuition exemption, as well as understanding your local community colleges, universities, and technical programs, and having a clear understanding of what programs of study would be covered by using the DCF tuition waiver. So when it comes to eligibility, it was mentioned previously, but I just wanna, again, I just wanna reinforce some of the thoughts and some of the information that was shared. Eligibility is determined based on where a foster care student is living on their 18th birthday. If at the age of 18, a student is still under the jurisdiction of the Department of Children and Families, the Florida Department of Children and Families, chances are that student is eligible to receive a DCF tuition waiver. We're talking about students who may have been adopted through the DCF system, students who maybe were living in a licensed foster home, students who through DCF were placed with a relative or a non-relative are likely eligible to receive this tuition benefit. In addition to understanding who is eligible, it's important to understand, again, the, the institutions that are in your local communities and understanding which college programs, which university programs and adult ed or technical programs would be covered 
through the, DC, through the DCF waiver. So in an effort to really streamline the support that you're offering to students, I implore you to really um, take the time to understand the eligibility requirements as well as the, the academic programs that are available to students. Now, many of you may be wondering, well, I have this student who I think might be eligible, but how do I know for sure? I can share that in my experience, I've come across students who have shared, you know, I remember living with my grandmother. I remember being placed with the nice lady in my church. I, I know I didn't live with my mom and my dad, but I don't really understand the circumstances that led to me living with these people. Um, it's important to collaborate with your local community-based care organization or your foster care lead agency because they are essentially the folks who are the experts in determining eligibility and also sharing the benefits and resources that are available to students who've been impacted by the foster care system. Much like our students who have been impacted by the foster care system, we have our students who are part of the McKinney-Vento programs throughout the state who are either housing insecure, at high risk of becoming homeless, or unaccompanied young people. Much like I mentioned in terms of com communicating with and collaborating with your foster care lead agency, you also want to identify the McKinney-Vento district liaison who is assigned to your school to again, understand if there are tuition waivers available for these students, as well as the, the available resources and benefits that may be available. Most of all, the key takeaway in establishing these collaborations is to build a sense of community, building a small community around each and every one of your students. It's also important to know that every student's community of support may look a little different. We have some students whose community of support might include a parent, a case manager, and a family friend. Whereas we have some students who their community of support may seem a lot smaller. In any situation, we want to make sure that students feel supported and they understand that there will be a handoff or a group of people ready and willing to support them as they pursue their post-secondary studies. Another tool or strategy that's really, really important when working with students either impacted by foster care or faced with housing insecurity is early identification. Again, collaborating with district liaisons as well as the foster care lead agencies help tremendously when it comes to early identification. Oftentimes in my case, I am given a direct referral either from the foster care lead agency or through the school system by way of a, a district liaison who's assigned to the McKinney-Vento program. Once these students are identified, again, at Miami-Dade College, we are often invited to go out to the students' high schools and meet with students as early as ninth and 10th grade. The post-secondary conversation, as you all know, should not start in 12th grade. In my case, I have the opportunity to go out to the local high schools, our feeder schools, and work with and just have conversations with students around what college life will involve. Many times students don't know that they have to have a state ID to prove that they are an in-state student to, re to receive um, in-state tuition as opposed to paying out-of-state fees. These are conversations that are very, very helpful when we start them in 10th grade as opposed to someone who's very close to their graduation date who hasn't yet obtained a Florida ID card. Another opportunity that we have for early identification is through Educate Tomorrow's Summer Gateway Program, which we call TCE or the College Experience. In our summer TCE program, we have an immersive college readiness program. It's not a summer camp because we know that high school students don't go to summer camp, but what we have is a college immersion program where students for six full weeks have the opportunity to meet with college coaches such as myself key college personnel, such as financial aid representatives, academic advisors, faculty and staff, to really understand what their college life will be like. During the college readiness program, we are exposing students to different um, academic programs, helping students to really identify their interests and their areas of study, and even exploring career pathways with them. So we've talked about eligibility for the DCF exemption and other tuition waivers. We talked about the need to collaborate with other folks outside of our institutions and identifying eligible students early on. 
So what happens once they make it to the college system? What, what happens once they make it to the college campus? This is where my work with the student truly catapults and I can really accelerate and build on the rapport that I established with the students while they were in high school. Miami Day College currently has the largest campus-based support system, support program designed specifically for students impacted by the foster care system. In the last several years, we've also included students who were impacted by housing insecurity because again, um, the needs tend to overlap and we want to make sure that we are opening doors and creating opportunities for all of our marginalized students. So in my role as a college coach, the first step that I like to take is collaborating with key institutional departments and individuals to be able to create a streamlined um, support system for all of our incoming students. What this looks like is um, collaborating with our admissions department, helping the students in completing the admissions application, helping students to complete the FAFSA application, and really trying to be the single point of contact and a single, um, and trying our best to address all of the students' needs or as many of the students' needs in one office. Um, and these needs may, may not be acad academic needs. These may be needs surrounding housing um, insecurity and other needs. So we really do our best to collaborate with our community partners and again with our institutional partners to ensure that the student's first experience in the college system is a positive one. Once a student comes to my office and we've completed the onboarding process, it's important to understand and assess the needs of each and every student. Each student may present with a different scenario and we want to make sure, as Brandy had mentioned in her presentation, we want to start them out on a solid foundation. We want students to feel confident when they come to Miami Dade College. We want all of our students to feel that college is the place for them. And when I say college, I mean any post-secondary um, setting. Again, we offer specific and streamlined FAFSA support with our students. We offer assistance when it comes to mentoring, coaching, leadership development, we help to identify exclusive scholarship opportunities, and we really want our students to have a holistic and well-rounded college experience. All of the work that goes into um, the Educate Tomorrow at Miami Dade College program is specifically designed to help onboard students, help students to be retained, and we provide direct and very up-close um, assistance until the student reaches the point of completion or earning a college credential. And in the case of Brandy and in Janessa's case, who we'll hear from in a few moments, our support extends far beyond the graduation date. Ultimately, we want our students to have meaningful relationships, long-term relationships, so they can then um, move on to bigger and better things and accomplish all of their academic and professional goals. Thank you so much. Hi hey everyone, good afternoon. Um, I'd like to share with you a couple of thoughts, you know, adding on what Wendy has spoken about. Um, she talked a lot about really getting to know your student and, um, and understanding what the situation is. Um, so a couple of thoughts I wanna just start with, um, you know, what happens if your students are 18 and they're still in high school um, and they're in foster care? You know, they need to figure out what is their housing options next. Um, there were a couple of questions in the Q&A about housing, and I'll get to that in a second. We do have some resources um, that are statewide for housing. Um, but, you know, there's a lot that they need to consider as a, a young 18 year old um, who's still in high school. They need to figure out what are their next steps. Also, you know, to reemphasize this problem, 50% this is specific for Miami-Dade County, but 50% of 18 to 21, 24 year olds who are experiencing homelessness have been in foster care. Um, so, you know, I think that, that that trend is probably the case throughout the state. Um, and it's something that is really important to think about, you know, how can we really help to stabilize the housing for these, these students? Um, and as you think about how to support students, I think that um, really focusing on their strengths and helping them, you know, think about what are their, what are the things that they can bring to this world 
that helps to, to, to figure out, you know, what are my next steps and how can I find, um, you know, how can I find something that's meaningful for me as well as beneficial for the community. Um, so there's a lot of different resources, you know, of course, we understand that counselors are, are super busy. There's a lot of different resources to help you um, support the students. Um, those children who are in foster care should all have guardian ad litems. And they are individuals who really advocate for this, the student themselves. They make sure that that child, you know, in court cases um, is heard, whatever their opinions are and, and where they need to go. They figure out how to make that happen for the student. So they can be a really good partner um, for a college counselor, you know, trying to figure out what is the next step for, for that child. Also, Wendy um, and, and Dr. Rios mentioned the McKinney-Vento resources. Um, each district should have their own McKinney-Vento liaisons who provide support and different types of resources to students who are experiencing homelessness, um, either with their families or who are unaccompanied. Um, another really great resource to make sure that your, your students are getting what they need from the school and moving towards their college plan um, is that every student who's in foster care should have an IEP, which is an individual education plan. Um, it's essential that those are annually reviewed and that you know those are actually enforced for the student in their in their classrooms. So I know that that they're um, very confidential and it's hard to get the information. But the student should have access to that information and be able to advocate for themselves. So that's something you can help them learn how to advocate for themselves um, with their teachers or with other professionals. Um, there's also a number of resources like the local children's trust. They have all kinds of after school programs and, you know, support programs for college readiness um, that can help provide support for the students. Same thing with trio programs. Um, those are funded by the Department of Education and they provide college readiness and other types of support both for high school students and students once they're in college. Um, other private resources to consider, I, I mentioned in the Q&A also, um, there's a number of different types of emergency funds that students can, re can access based on, you know, having a history in foster care or having a history with homelessness. Um, some of the emergency funds that we like to work with a lot are the AOK Foundation, and they it's a scholarship program, so you do need to apply to it. I included the link in the Q&A. Um, and another option is in Soro, which is another scholarship opportunity, but both of those are emergency funds. Um, so they help students who are in need, for example, of like um, paying rent or, you know, needing some extra food resources um, and, you know, or helping with their car, for example. Um, there's also a number of local foundations that will provide emergency funds. Um, for example, our Children's Trust has a huge source of funds that are dedicated towards providing emergency support for the community. Um, and so you can find resources like that, you know, through, through the local Children's Trust. Um, other community resources, of course, libraries and museums, you know, good to remember those free resources. Um, that we have. And then housing options. A great scholarship for housing is called the Southern Scholarship Foundation. They provide campus housing basically for, um, for college students, very low cost. Um, and, and again, it's kind of a scholarship program, so you need to apply for it ahead of time. But they have, I think, six or seven different houses throughout the state of Florida, and they're always partnered with different universities. Um, there's also HUD vouchers, which is the housing department um, that can provide support for, um, for housing. You know, they have like multi-year programs that, that can provide low-income housing. Um, and then, you know, other options that are local, like for us, we have Casa Valentina, which is just a housing group um, that provides life skills and also reduced income housing. 
Um, and then, you know, it's important to, to consider the community specific things, like how can you build a community for the students, um, honoring their birthdays and different holidays. And then as um, Ms. Joseph mentioned, you know, having different types of college readiness programs over the summer to help prepare students for their college programs. I'm gonna pass it off to Janessa, who's gonna close us um, with her experiences. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Janessa Collins. I am a recent FIU graduate, and I am currently working as a natural helper at Educate Tomorrow. Um, I started off as a student within the program. I was connected with Educate Tomorrow in my ninth grade year while I was in care, and through um, educate and um, independent living services within my foster care agency, I was made aware that I do qualify for the DCF tuition waiver in the state of Florida. So I was aware of this um, rather early on in my high school career. Um, while in high school, uh, the resources that were there that were available for me um, was mostly provided by my counselor as far as the application process to um, applying to colleges, filling out FAFSA, and um, having those conversations of post-secondary education. And that was a benefit, I think, of me being in AP and dual enrollment courses. So um, I do, because those classes are college focused, it was a natural conversation for those uh, topics to come up. While some of my peers in the regular classes or in um, others who may have been in care may not have been made aware of these resources because it wasn't necessarily college focused or at least in my experience in the feedback that I have received from um, my peers. They, they may not have been aware of um, like uh, vouchers for college applications and things of that sort. Um, my experience in using the IEPs. So my counselor would often uh, bring up the use of IEPs when we would meet, we met uh, regularly. The conversation was always open. It was very free flowing. And I was comfortable in that situation to have these conversations with her because she focused on the fact of what I wanted. And it was really, getting down to the point of why would I want to pursue this, not why she thought I should pursue this. And that was something that I really did appreciate. As I transitioned into college, um, my first semester was not necessarily successful because when I went in, I didn't connect with anybody on campus. And I believe that may have been that one semester where Miss Wendy had just transitioned into maternity leave. So my first semester, I didn't get to connect, but the second semester I was able to connect with the change makers on campus that is that were the interns made available by Educate Tomorrow. They uh, did the same thing that uh, me and Brandy are doing now, helping others um, in their pursuits and getting enrolled in these courses who utilize the tuition waivers. And so once um, I was able to connect to other Educate Tomorrow students, my college experience did improve. I was able to connect to others um, in different programs, just being involved in uh, extracurricular activities. So I did make connections with uh, peers who were also in care and also pursuing um, this folk secondary life. Um, while being at Educate Tomorrow, I've had many opportunities presented to me. And some of the things that I've been able to do is volunteer and chaperone the college tours for our high school students. And just being able to see the students on campus in these spaces and them being able to envision themselves there, it, it was a lot um, much better received by these, by these high school students in care who may have not considered going to school or even considering like a certificate program or a trade in that sense. 
And so that is something that I am uh, grateful for being able to do. One thing that I wanted to note uh, that I feel as if is a great piece of advice is just understanding that college may not be for everyone, but having some form of education should be for anyone. And um, I think that is what we should promote to students in care is that it, it, you don't have to go to college, but having some form of degree does bring in some way of wealth down the line. Yes. Thank you, Janessa and everyone else. Um, very useful information. I would like to turn it over to a Q&A now, just in case there are any other questions from the audience or anything else that we may need to touch on. I know there was a few questions about IEPs that Amy and Janessa, you just touched on as well. So maybe if both of you would like to dig in deeper on what exactly is an IEP and what do students and counselors need to know from that? Yes, um, I can share. So um, IEP, I am not sure of the exact abbreviation. I think it is intended educational plan. I could be wrong about that, but that is used um, as a tool by the student to understand what courses they need um, for to, to complete their, their high school career. And um, many times it is usually shared with the student. It should be a conversation that happens in ninth grade so that you are made aware of this um, before you are um, later on in your high school, later on like in the upperclassmen, I mean. And so these conversations should be had normally and also reviewed uh, by semester to make sure that you are staying on track. Yes, um, thanks, Janessa. So just a little further, usually it's the um, like academic counselor who does the IEPs and initiates the review of those. It could also be um, the, the student's advisor, like their homeroom um, teacher. Um, and like every student who's in foster care should have an IEP. Um, and it basically provides additional supports um, for those students to make sure that they are, you know, getting whatever they need in order to be successful in school. Um, their IEP should be reviewed every year, and it's something that they should know about what their accommodations are. So it is something that the students should have access to. Um, usually the foster parent or um, their case manager would be involved in the conversation and they can help to advocate for the child. Um, but, you know, sometimes those people turn over quickly also, you know, so that they may not know, you know, what's on that IEP. So it's really important to help the student know what their IEP is so that they can advocate for themselves as much as possible. Wonderful. And also, I know, Steve, you touched on this in the Q&A, if you might want to dig in deeper. Someone asking about, are DCF tuition exemptions available to undocumented students in foster care or experiencing homelessness? If not, are there any specific programs serving that population? Since I know Afkan did recently do a webinar on undocumented students, maybe there is any more information that they could uh, benefit from. Yeah, well, the main thing to, to know is that if, if a student is undocumented, um, a good number of times they may, and if they're in, you know, working with a foster care agency, that agency might um, have opportunities for them. Uh, there are also um, programs that were mentioned by Dr. Rubinson that um, don't ask about, you know, whether or not the student is um, it's documented or undocumented. So I think it's really a matter of looking at that list and um, pursuing especially private scholarships that might be available. The, um, one of the things that, that I, I wanted to emphasize is that um, you know, we have so much to be grateful for here in Florida in terms of helping students. We just recently did an analysis and um, more than 3,000 young people 
have graduated from foster care. Um, uh, more than 3,000 young people from foster care have graduated with a degree, a bachelor's or an associate. The vast majority are bachelor's and associates. Um, and you know, there are a good number of certificates as well. But I think it's a tremendous testament uh, to the work that Florida is doing that we have so many young people over the past decade or so who have graduated. Uh, definitely wanted to emphasize that. And I also want to emphasize the fact that, you know, to have uh, so many um, counselors around the state who are interested in this topic, uh, I really, you know, appreciate this opportunity. And I know that Kathy is going to be asking people if they would like a more in-depth training. Um, please take advantage of answering that because here at Positive Pathways uh, and Educate Tomorrow, we're dedicated to developing these kinds of uh, presentations so that we can really deliver um, information that you need. And I know that this just touches the surface of what you all are interested in knowing about. We received uh, a page, you know, a full page of questions and um, our team is gonna be working on those questions. So if you submitted a question, please realize that we took them seriously and we're gonna be working to answer them and, um, and provide answers either in a future training or definitely uh, on a, a website that you can access. Thank you, Steve. And then Wendy, I know you work more hands-on with the students and preparing them for the academic experience. What is it like with the transition into college, since I know a lot of counselors may be struggling with keeping them on track and having that post-secondary idea in their heads throughout the whole process. So what is the first step that you would think? I would say that the first step is to encourage, encourage, encourage. We have to remember that when working with young people impacted by foster care, we may be literally the only ones who are countering the idea that college isn't for them. I've, inter I've interacted with so many students who were told by an adult in their life that they are not college material, that college is not for them, that they should just get a GED and go get a job. These are, these are the, the thoughts that we are in the position to counter when we are meeting with young students. So. The first step for me is establishing a sense of encouragement and really emphasizing to the student that they can do this, you know? And I, a, a second piece of advice is to remind the student that they are running their own race in their own lane and not competing with anyone. You know, where some students may earn an associate's degree in two years flat, we may have students who earn that same degree in three years, but at the end of the day, the credential remains the same. The student won't even complete the admissions application if they don't if they don't believe that they are college material. So the first step is to really establish with the student that we believe in them, that there is one adult, at least one adult who believes that they can do this. And then we want to continue to build on that relationship. And I think Brandy or Janessa had mentioned during their remarks that we want to establish a sense of trust. The student will begin to trust us if we are accountable to the things that we say that we're, if we do the things that we say that we're going to do and we help in the way that we say that we're going to help. So number one, we wanna establish a sense of encouragement within that student. And secondly, we wanna hold their hand until they say, you know, you can walk alongside me, but we don't have to hold hands anymore. Those are the two pieces of advice that I have. Wonderful, thank you for Hi. that, Wendy. Uh, if I can, Wendy, um, can you address like the number of students that qualify for like Pell Grants and um, like the PEST, the $1,256 a month monthly stipend and uh, just kind of how, how do you help students make sure that they're not taking out massive student loan you know, debt there? Absolutely, Brett. So let me be clear in sharing that I am not a fan of student loans for any of my students, for anyone for that matter, but particularly with students who are eligible for a waiver or an exemption of some sort, the need to take out student loans really doesn't exist. Between the waiver or exemption, waiving the full cost of their tuition and fees, including admissions applications, 
um, and the fact that the majority of our students being eligible for the maximum Pell Grant, there really is no need to take out any sort of additional funding. Additional funding is always great when it comes in the form of a scholarship or a grant. Um, however, I would say over 95% of the students who I work with at Miami-Dade College are eligible for the maximum Pell Grant. The reason for that is because they are determined to be independent students. Once a student indicates on the FAFSA application that they have been impacted by the foster care system, the application itself in bold print says, you are considered an independent student. What that means is the student will not be asked to provide any sort of parental um, tax information or income information. And all of the decisions are based on the student's income, which usually is zero. So when it comes to students and being able to fund their education, um, the Pell Grant definitely covers the cost of books and materials and then some. And then we also, as I mentioned earlier, encourage all of our students to apply for exclusive scholarship opportunities, institutional grants and other funding opportunities. Wonderful, thank you. And I guess along with all of that, with all these resources available for all these students, how can schools and colleges work together with community partners to build that strong connection so that students can have the seamless support all the way through? If I can um, just share some thoughts on this topic. Um, at Miami Day College, and this is my point of reference, uh, because it's where I work. But at Miami Day College, we have an entire department that's dedicated to working with students who are in high school. Um, we have pre-college advisors who again, go to the high schools and they are meeting with those students. In addition to what I may be doing with those high school students, we have entire departments and groups of professionals who are establishing connections and, and creating supports to high school students long before high school graduation. It's really important for students to have a sense of consistency and feel that sense of support so that when they graduate and then they come to the college campus, they recognize some of those same faces. They recognize those logos like the one that's behind me. They recognize, oh, that looks familiar. I remember learning about this program. I remember hearing about this uh, TCE Summer Gateway program while I was in high school. So all of those different avenues creates a seamless transition for most of our students. Um, so the more we connect with students while they are in high school, the better supported they're going to feel when they get to the college or university or tech school campus. So I would encourage connect with your local community college, connect with folks at your university, connect with the departments who support students impacted by foster care and those who are using the McKinney Vento exemptions and you know, create those support systems for your students before they graduate from high school. We have a couple of questions about, um, you know, even before they get into high school. So um, I think for sure, um, you know, to find out what your community has to offer. I think one of the things is to make sure that the students in foster care have access to a myriad of programs that already exist, but they may not know about them. Their foster parents who may be overwhelmed, might have four and five students in the house, may not know that um, right around the corner, there is a tutoring program, for instance, that they might have access to. And um, a lot of times the students can get these things paid for, by the agency that's taking care of them. So make sure that they take advantage of that. Uh, or the program is just free um, because it's funded right. you know, by something else. Like um, I put in the chat, there's the Upward Bound programs which are funded by the Department of Education. Right. Those are college readiness programs. They have tutoring, Saturday programs, an intensive summer program, it's wonderful. Um, there's also, um, you know, your local children's trust, um, like whatever or yeah. foundation. Children's services councils. They're called children's yeah, services councils. Those, yeah. they yes, they provide they provide programming, after school programming, all kinds of college readiness enrichment, um, and it's all free. Right. 
Wonderful. Well, thank you all for the information. Thank you to our panelists and for everyone for listening. Upcoming, we are coming up on our um, end of the hour. So thank you so much. Please join us for our next webinar, Where Do Students Go? How Do You Know? Options for Data Starved Districts on January 27th. Registration is on FCAN's website. And to ensure you don't miss out on any other upcoming webinars and information, please subscribe to FCAN's newsletter. Thank you for joining us today and have a wonderful day. Thank you.